We're still on that adventure in the Bible. And we've been looking at the subject of rightly dividing. When you approach the Bible, you got to rightly divide or you're going to come come up with some wild stuff. You're going to start making the Bible contradict itself and everything else. So I'm trying to teach you how to rightly divide. And we've made it to the dispensation of the law. It says in John 1.17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the time of the law started with Moses and lasted up until Jesus Christ, so around 1,500 years long. And in Luke 16.16, 16, it says, The law and the prophets were until John. Notice that until. We're really putting emphasis on words that have to do with time. Until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. So, when did John show up? This is John the Baptist. When did he show up? During the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. So, during the Lord's earthly ministry in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see a transition taking place. You see, you can't just do like a really precise cutting in the dispensations and be like, well, it stopped here. You can't say, well, this dispensation stopped here and this one started here, like a thin slice cut. No, they transition into each other. So they're still under the law when Jesus Christ shows up. He was born under the law, but there's a transition. It's tr taking you... The earthly ministry of Jesus, it's taking you from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's, it's a transition into it. And most of our time so far has been spent in the book of Genesis. It's just so many dispensations within the book of Genesis. It covers such a long period of time. But now we're going to move on to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. But in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he was actually alive during those books, during the time that those books took place. So Moses is big in these next four books of the Bible. I mean, Moses is big throughout the entire Bible. He just shows up everywhere. But all those books, those first five books are written by Moses. And then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all four of those books Keep this in mind when you approach the Bible. Those four books, they take place around that same 40-year time period where Israel's wandering in the wilderness, mostly the, uh, in that 40-year time period. That's a lot different than Genesis that covers such a huge time period, you see. But Israel, remember Jacob got his name changed to Israel, and that's why they're called the children of Israel. Israel, which is Jacob, and his family, they end up in Egypt by the end of the book of Genesis because, you know, the whole thing with Joseph and how he's sold off and he ends up in Egypt, but he ends up being the second ruler in the kingdom. And, and the Lord told Jacob, he said, Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make of thee a great nation. So Israel ends up down there in Egypt, and the, the, that Pharaoh at the time, he was, a, he was a decent guy, and he took care of him and stuff. And, but then you get into Exodus chapter 1, and it says, And there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So it, they were in, in a, a hard way from then on out. And the Lord used the hardships on Egypt to turn Israel into warriors. I mean, you, you, um, you, work, you get up and work every day and serve with rigor and hard bondage. You're going to turn into uh, a, a fighting machine. But there arose a new king over Egypt, which you not, knew not Joseph. And that Pharaoh began to make Israel serve with rigor and hard bondage. And Israel didn't come out of Egypt for 430 years, according to Exodus 1240. But Israel, had they cried out to God, and God sent Moses to be their deliverer. Up until this time, God had been allowing them to govern, them, govern themselves, you see. When Israel got out of Egypt... They were all mixed up because of the morals of Egypt, the idolatry, and their rebellion against God. So the Lord had to bring in the law, which they also agreed to themselves. And Israel got into the covenant of the law, 
when the Lord gave Moses the commandments on Sinai and the law didn't make void the Abrahamic covenant. Remember that. It just added to it. Now, there, there, were, um, there were conditions to them keeping the land uh, temporarily, but when it comes to the grand scheme of things, because of the Abrahamic covenant, they're getting the land and they're keeping the land. That will happen in the future. They're going to get the land, keep the land because of that Abrahamic covenant. Galatians 3.19 says this. It says, Where then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Egypt or Israel got mixed up in Egypt and all that the world stuff. And Egypt is a picture of the world. Just like Christians, we get out into the world. We get mixed up in the world stuff. So we got to go back to the Bible and go by these commandments that Paul gives us. You know, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, he says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. You see, the law was added because of transgressions. The law had to come in because they weren't governing governing themselves very good. You know, we were under the dispensation of human government, and they just don't govern themselves too well. So the Lord uh, has to lay down the law, as they say. And he wants to be the king of their heart. And you get to Exodus 20, and look what it says in verse 6. It says, In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. You see that they got defiled with those idols of Egypt. So the law was added because of transgressions. Now the law was between God and Israel. You have to note this. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. Israel might have been called the church in the wilderness, but they're not ch the church, which is the Lord's body, you see. And the very sign of the covenant between God and Israel was the Sabbath, and that was said to be a sign between God and who? Israel. Exodus thirty-one thirteen. And see, these are the statutes and judgments and laws that the Lord made between him and the children of Israel and Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Leviticus 26, 46. It was between him and the children of Israel and Mount Sinai. The law but was between God and Israel. While the law was in operation, the Gentiles were a law unto themselves, you see. They had it written in their heart. In Romans 2, 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles, which is anybody that's not a Jew, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So the law was between God and Israel, but a Gentile, he operated by his conscience, and God had the work of the law written in their heart, just like Abimelech back there with, in that story with Abraham, he knew that adultery was wrong. It was in his heart. It was written in his heart, you see. Now, the law shows you your sinfulness. It was added because of transgressions. It was, a, it was between God and Israel. But the law, it shows you your sinfulness. It shows me my sinfulness when you read it. In Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's how you know. That's how you know you're a sinner. You try to line yourself up with the law, you, you never make it. 
nobody ever kept the law perfectly. It says in Romans 3, 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them which are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Everybody is guilty. You're guilty. I'm guilty. The best Christian you ever know is guilty. Your grandmother-in-law is guilty. Your uh, stepmother-in-law is guilty. All those people that think that they're so, that they're so holy and everything. Your mother-in-law, your granddaddy, your grandma, everybody you see is as as righteous. You know, you got that person in your family that's like a, a, a lot older than you, been a Christian a long time. You think that they can do no wrong. They are also guilty. Every mouth may be stopped. All the world may become guilty before God. James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. The only man who kept it perfectly is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke 24, 44, it says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. He fulfilled everything. And, and all the tops he was supposed to fulfill. All the prophecies he was supposed to fulfill. And all the... 613 some laws he did him perfectly everything he was supposed to do he did it jesus christ satisfied every demand of the law and then offered himself as the lamb of god for those who couldn't satisfy the demands of the law then he offers you his righteous record in exchange for believing on him to be your savior and after jesus christ paid the penalty for the sin of every man who ever lived the Old Testament saints then, only then, could be cleared of their sin that they had only received forgiveness for. You see, they could get forgiveness for sin, but they couldn't get their sins taken away like me and you do. You know, they'd have to offer a blood sacrifice to get the sin taken away, but just until the next time they sinned again, you see. See, the, nobody was, uh, nobody got eternal life from keeping the law. They got it from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they, uh, they couldn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ until Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for their sins and was buried and resurrected and offered salvation to them. You know, they, uh, the Lord couldn't apply the blood of Jesus Christ to them before the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. That's why they, under the law, they had those animal sacrifices set up. But what you have under the law is the Mosaic Covenant. Like I said, the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And in Exodus 34, 27, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. So this is the Mosaic covenant. That's the covenant that you find under the law. It's like with, uh, with Noah, you had the Noahic covenant. With Abraham, you had the Abrahamic covenant. With Adam, you had the Adamic covenant. It says in Galatians 3.19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So, God gave the law to Moses. Moses gave the law to them. Just like in the New Testament, Paul gave us, uh, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave all this revelation to Paul. Paul gave it to us. Now, you need to recognize Old Testament versus New Testament. It's just basic stuff. Like in uh, 2 Corinthians three thirteen through 16, you're going to plainly see an Old Testament. It says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away, in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. You see, it says, For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. You see, when the Jews read the Old Testament, they don't see what me and you see. They don't see Jesus Christ on every page. They don't see that Jesus Christ fulfilled all the prophecies. They don't see Jesus Christ in the typology. They got that veil. 
that remains in front of them while they read the Old Testament. But that veil is going to be taken away. But you plainly see it talks about an Old Testament. I mean, you can't deny that. And if there was an Old Testament, there's a New Testament. And if there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, there's differences in your Bible and you have to rightly divide. It's called the First Testament in Hebrews 9, 15 through 19. Look at this, Hebrews 9, 15, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You see, Jesus Christ had to die to bring in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't officially start until the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither... The first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. You see, if they were getting the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to them before, before it even took place, before it was even shed, then why did they need the blood of bulls and goats? That blood and bulls and goats was just a temporary thing. It couldn't take away sin. You see, righteousness in the Old Testament is not the same as righteousness in the New Testament. Look at this in 2 Chronicles 6.23. It says, Then hear thou from heaven and do, and judge thy servants by recriding the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head, and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness, according to his righteousness. You see that? It was about their righteousness. In Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25, it says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. They said it should be our righteousness if they do all those commandments. But look what it says about us in the New Testament. Rightly divide, you see, Romans 3.21. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, in the New Testament, there's none righteous, no, not one. And the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You get the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to you the moment you believe. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Old Testament saints were not sealed by the Holy Spirit. In Judges 16.20, Samson lost the Holy Spirit. In 1 Samuel 16.14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. In Psalm 51.11, uh, David prayed for the Lord not to take his Holy Spirit from him. That's different from today, where a person is sealed into the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. I can't lose the Holy Spirit. Someone who doesn't rightly divide is in danger of going back to Psalm 51, 11 and saying, take not thy Holy Spirit from me or thinking they can lose it like Samson and Saul. You see, the law can't seal you into the day of redemption. Under the law, they couldn't get eternal life. You see, don't get confused because nobody's saying they got eternal life by keeping the law. That only comes through Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. See, in the Old Testament, they had their own righteousness, which was of the law. But Paul counts that but dung now, he says. And now he's got the righteousness of God by faith. The righteousness of God is Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.21, it says, And is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But it wasn't. You get righteousness by the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, under the law, they had a tabernacle and a physical temple. Today, the body of believers is the temple. You see the difference? You got to rightly divide. 
1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 tells you your body is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're bought with a price. If you don't rightly divide, you may think that God is, in, is dwelling in temples made by hands. But he's actually dwelling in you today if you're saved and you're taking him everywhere that you go. Under the law in Leviticus 11, it goes over clean and unclean animals that you can eat and that you can't eat. If you fail to rightly divide, you might end up going back there to uh, Leviticus 11 and saying, well, I can't eat this or I can't eat that. And I can't eat this and I can't eat that. But you're not rightly dividing. Because Paul comes back and says in 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, that it's a doctrine of a devil to tell somebody that they have to abstain from meats. He says in, in 1 Timothy 4, 3, he says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. And he called that a doctrine of, of a devil in 1 Timothy 4, to tell somebody that they can't marry and that they have to abstain from meats. He says in verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you can give thanks for it, you can eat it. You don't have to go by the clean and unclean animals. Under the law, the Jews had to keep the Sabbath. Like in Exodus 31, 13, he says, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. He said that to Israel. It was a sign between Israel and the Lord. But Paul lets you know today, for me and you, rightly dividing, that you don't have to keep the Sabbath or any holy day. You got all these people going around saying that you got to keep the Sabbath. And they think that they're keeping the Sabbath because they, they go to church on Saturday. But Paul says in Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. Let nobody judge you on that. He says in Romans 14.5, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The days are the same. I, I want to be, I want to live for the Lord just as much on, on Saturday as I do every day. Just as much on Sunday as I do every day. Just as much on Monday as I do any other day. Every day, you're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Under the law, you would get forgiveness for sins by the blood of many sacrifices. But they didn't take away sin. Today, you get forgiveness by the blood of one sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a huge difference. Huge difference. See Hebrews 10 for that. It says in Hebrews 10, 1, For the law, having a good shadow of things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. You see, those sacrifices couldn't make them perfect. For then would they, have, when, then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. With the per perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is no remembrance made of your sin. He says in verse 4 to Hebrews 10, 4, It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. But it's possible with the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, that takes away sin. It says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He once suffered for sins. We got the perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's all you need. But you see, Moses, he, the law was given by Moses. Moses pictures the law that can't get you salvation. Then you get to the book of Joshua. You make it through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You get to Joshua. Joshua pictures Jesus Christ 
who takes you further than the law ever did. Joshua got them into the promised land. Moses didn't get them in. Joshua got them in. Moses died without getting to go in the promised land. Joshua was his successor. And you can read about Joshua leading Israel in battles throughout the book of Joshua that picture the second coming of Jesus Christ. And after the book of Joshua, you get into the book of Judges. And the book of Judges shows you what happens when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. That's why it's such a crazy book. Because when every man does that which is right in his own eyes, you know, something that's right in this guy's eyes could be just straight filthy. But Israel, throughout the book of Judges, they keep rebelling against the Lord. The Lord allows an enemy to take them over, and then they cry out to God. God, in his mercy, raises up a deliverer. Guys like Samson, guys like Gideon, Jephthah, Shamgar, Ehud. Uh, these guys are the judges or, de or deliverers who deliver Israel, like Moses delivered Israel back there in Egypt. But in Judges 2.16, it says, that, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And in Acts 13.20, And after that, he gave them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And so next time, we'll get into the uh, more about the kings of Israel and Judah. And, you know, during the book of Joshua, and the book of Judges, they're still... It's still supposed to be under the law. Throughout the kings, they're still supposed to be under the law, even though they're not going by it. So we'll get into all that, and we'll get into more dispensations, more uh, time periods, um, more covenants.